Amen. <clears throat> All right, well, we're there in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter number four. And um, if you could just turn me up, I, I, I'm not able to hear myself. Thank you. Just a, just a hair. Um, <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter four. If you look at verse number nine, um, this is the verse I'd like you to notice, these several verses here. Ecclesiastes chapter four and verse nine. The Bible says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall... The one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat, but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And whenever I look at this passage, or whenever we read these passages, I always like to point out the fact that we as human beings were created by God for community. We were created to live in community. We were created to live alongside uh, each other. We were not created to face this life alone. And that's what uh, Solomon is teaching us here in this chapter in Ecclesiastes. He says, look, two are better than one. And I like how he, <clears throat> he says in verse 9, two are better than one. And then he goes and gives us uh, reasons why two are better than one. He says, if you fall, then the one will lift you up. And uh, he said, you don't want to be alone when you fall and not have another to help you. He says, if you lie together, and he's just using these examples, but he's saying, look, if, if you lie together, uh, you're going to be cold. But if you're lying next to another individual, uh, then you will be warm. You know, and, and of course, sometimes when people find themselves in in situations where they're surviving for their lives, maybe they're lost in the wilderness or whatever, you'll, uh, you'll know that pe- people will lie next to each other to be able to have that warmth uh, with each other. And he says, look, if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And then I like how he ends because he says two are better than one in verse 9. And then in verse th- uh, 12 he says, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. He says two are better than one. And he says, but you know what's better than two? Three. And the idea is, you know, if, if he continued... What's better than three? Four. And what's better than four? Five. And what's better than five? Fifty. What's better than fifty? A hundred and fifty or hundred and eighty or two hundred. And the idea is this, that you and I were created to live in community, to live alongside other people. Go with me to the book of Genesis, if you would. First book in the Bible, Genesis chapter number two. I want you to notice what God said to Adam when he created him. Genesis chapter two and verse number 18 Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. I'm losing my voice, so I'll preach as long as I can, and then we'll be done, all right? Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. I feel fine. I just, just my voice is is weak. uh, Genesis 2, 18, the Bible says this, And the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And of course, we often look at this passage in regards to marriage, and I, that's definitely the application, and that's how it applies, but it's not just marriage. The Bible says it's, it's not good for a man to be alone, and the truth is this, it's not good for any of us to be alone, because if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. It's good for us to live in relationships, to live in communities, to live alongside each other, facing life together. And here's the point. The point is this, that you were not made to live alone. You were not made to live on an island physically or relationally or emotionally separated from other people. If you would go to the book of Romans in the New Testament, you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Romans chapter number 14. And by the way, we as humans inherently know that this is true. We want to be around other people. This is why uh, social media is so big, right? It's why websites like Facebook and Twitter or whatever, they're so popular and they're so, uh, you know, accepted by uh, people. Why? Because innately we know there's this desire that is put in us to live in community, to live in uh, relationships, to live alongside other people. We are not meant to live alone or to be an island, uh, uh, just kind of going through life on our own. And we're not even meant to be an island just going through life with our 
uh, immediate family. You know, sometimes people live their lives with just husband, wife, and kids, and it's no one else, you know. And, and if, you, uh, if you homeschool, it, it, it's even worse, right? I mean, you're just, you never leave the house, you know. You, you know. You're just all together, clustered together. You have no relationships. You have no outside things. The Bible teaches that God created you to live alongside other people. He did not create you to live alone. Romans 14, 7, notice what the Bible says. Romans chapter 14 and verse 7, the Bible says, For none of us liveth to himself. And no man dieth to himself. The Bible says that you do not live to yourself. Your life is not yours to just live on your own. And you don't die to yourself. We are to live in community. And you say, well, I don't know, Pastor, you know, I think just me and my wife and my kids and our house, we're bunkered out in the middle of nowhere or whatever, you know. Why can't we go uh, get land in Guyana or get land in wherever and just, you know, be away from the world? Here's why we know that, because God created a local New Testament church for you to live in community with. And then God told that local New Testament church to go out into the highways and hedges and reach people with the gospel and make them part of the family of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would, you're there in Romans, just flip one uh, book over, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. See, God created us for community, but God also created a community called the local New Testament church. He created a community for you to live in, for you to live alongside of, for you to experience life with, for you to experience the ups and experience the downs. Are you there in 1 Corinthians 12? Now, in the Bible, the church is equated to lots of different things, a family, a a military. Here it's equated to a body. Notice what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 12, 14. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand... I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Behold, I am not the eye, I am uh, not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where uh, where were the smelling? And here's what he's saying. He's saying, just like a body needs different body parts, and they're all important, and they're all in need of each other, he says, in church life, We are all important, and we are all in need of each other. You can't have a body that's just an eye. You can't have a body that's just a foot. We need each other. Notice verse 18, and I think verse number 18, when it comes to the doctrine of the church and and church membership and belonging to the local church, I think 1 Corinthians 12, 18 is one of the most important verses in the Bible regarding that. Notice 1 Corinthians 12, 18, the Bible says this, But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. If you call Verity Baptist Church your home, and I realize we have visitors here uh, today, and we have visitors here uh, all the time, and praise the Lord for it. But if you call Verity Baptist Church your home, you know what I believe? I believe that God set you here to be part of this body. And you know that God will actually, and and again, we don't have time to develop this, but God is an investor, and God will actually take members out of certain churches that maybe are not using their resources properly. He might blow out their candlestick, and He will invest those members into other locations where they might be used properly, because God has set members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased Him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. See, you were created for community. And God created a community for you to live in, and it is the local New Testament church. And I'm saying all this this by introduction just to help you understand the sermon I'm preaching uh, this morning. And what I want to do just by way of introduction is give you the tale of two families. And I don't know why this is, but in church world, When it comes to church growth, it seems that church growth happens in clusters. My wife and I have uh, just kind of noticed this over the last nine years of ministries where whenever the church grows and whenever we add members, we don't ever, it seems, it's rare that we add a member. It usually happens in clusters. We'll add, you know, three or four faithful families will come all at once. Three or four faithful individuals will come all at once. And, And I don't know why God does it that way. He just 
It seems like that's how he's done it, at least here at Verity Baptist Church. And we've had multiple families join our church around the same time for years. I mean, and I could, I could point out names. I could g- give you names of people right now sitting right here, and I could say, you know, this person and this person and this family and these families, they all came, you know, within weeks of each other. And then uh, a few months later, this person, this person, this person, they all came within weeks of each other. And they just kind of happens in clusters. But I, I, I don't know why God does it that way. I just know that He does it that way. At least He's done it that way for us. But because God does it that way, it's allowed me and it's allowed my wife to clearly see two types of families, two types of families that uh, have came to our church. They're here now, and they've been here uh, since the beginning. And I'm not talking specifically about any individual family. What I'm talking about is uh, two types of individuals that will show up to a church like this, and it happens more times than I care to admit. One family might come here. They'll be reached through our soul winning. They might be reached through our media ministry. They might uh, move here or they might live here or whatever it might be. And they'll come here and they'll become part of this church and they'll get connected. This is a success story. They come to the church services faithfully. They apply the preaching of the Word of God to their lives. And therefore, there begins to be changes in their lives and growth in their lives. They go soul winning. They serve. They build relationships, they make relationships, they develop friendships. And these families, and we have several of them here this morning, some of you could testify to it, they're what the world would call in the business world, satisfied customers. Satisfied customers of Verity Baptist Church. And, 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 and you know, if we allowed you to give your testimony, some of you would stand up and say, this church has been nothing but a blessing to me. And I'm glad, you know, my friends are here. And I'm connected. And I'm serving. And I'm growing. And praise the Lord for it. And, and the Lord has allowed us to see a lot of those families. And I'm thankful for that. But at the same time, and sometimes literally at the same time, like they show up at the same time, there's another family. And it's not just another family. It might just be a single person. It might be a couple. But there's another unit that shows up. And their church attendance is sporadic. They never come to any of the events. They don't go soul winning. They don't serve. And they often end up slowly fading away with very few people even noticing. You'll hear of these families later, usually on social media, criticizing a church like our church saying, oh, well, they weren't friendly. They didn't reach out enough. They had, I never got connected. And, you know, my wife and I, for the last nine years, have watched individuals show up at the same time. And it seems like one group, one family, one individual grows and thrives in the same atmosphere under the same preaching with the same uh, uh, church family alongside them. And then you'll have another family and or another individual, another couple, that'll just kind of spiritually shrivel up and fade away and really not accomplish much for God. And we've asked ourselves, you know, what's the difference? What's the difference between these individuals? Because, and here's what the difference is, and here's what the truth is, and I've said all that to say this, and this is what the sermon is about. The point is this, that you will get as much out of this church or any church as you put into it. The truth is that part of the success of a church is how much you put into that church, how much effort you put into that church. Because see, the point is this, that a church is supposed to work together. They're supposed to come alongside each other. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 25, these are some of my favorite verses in regards to church life. 1 Corinthians 12, 25, the Bible says this, there should be no schism in the body, meaning separation, but that the members should have the same care one for another. The members should care for each other. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. And in a healthy church, and in a healthy relationship within church, this is how the Christian life should be lived. Not in separation, but where we all care for each other. And when one of us suffers, we all suffer. And when one of us is honored, we all rejoice. And we're all Glad. I'd like you to go to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number 10. If you start at the end of the book of Revelation and head back, you've got the book of Revelation, you've got Jude, you've got 3rd, 2nd, and 1st John, 2nd, and 1st Peter, James, and Hebrews. 
And while you go there, let me give you another illustration. I asked Brother Luke if he would be okay with me using him and his wife as an example. Many of you know, obviously most of you know, Luke and Angel recently lost their baby. And of course we're praying for them. And you know, just because the funeral's done, the mourning isn't done. So I would encourage you to continue to be praying for them. And along with Luke and Angel, along with their family, Mike and Diane and their physical family, you know, they had a church family that really showed up in strength around them. And, you know, I'm I'm saying meals were provided, hospital visits were made, not just by the pastor and the pastor's wife and the staff, but by many of you. And it wasn't really just our church family. It was even other churches of like faith and practice. I mean, it was churches all over this country, people all over this country. Some people who don't even know Luke and Angel, they just know us or they know you and they know what we know about Luke and Angel and they really came alongside them. And you know, during this time, they obviously had some major expenses, some huge medical bills, some burial costs. And you know, our church family and the network of other church families around the country in a matter of days raised over $30,000 to help them. And, and, and if you came to the funeral, it was a potluck and it was a feast in there. I mean, it, you could not have paid to have a, a, a greater turnout, uh, a catering than, than what they had there. And, and here's all I'm telling you. Here, and here's all I'm telling you. And I'm not, I'm not being negative, and I hope you understand that. Sometimes people go through trials in life And we try to be there for them. And honestly, it's like pulling teeth to try to get anyone to even provide a meal for them. And I'm not mad at the church family because it's not the church family's fault. It's just sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to care about somebody you don't even know. You never even really see. They show up on a Sunday morning maybe once every other month. And they go through a trial, and of course, I'll be there, and my wife will be there. But what is interesting is that when you have a couple, and I'm I'm just highlighting, using this as a reasonable example, this could be said of many of you, but when you have members like Luke and Angel who have been faithful, who have been involved, who have provided meals for others, who have made visits for others, it's just interesting how when they've invested themselves into a church family, when they needed a church family, the church family showed up. Because you are created, and I am created to live in community. So this morning, and all of that was introduction, and I'll try to do the rest of the sermon as quickly as possible. But this morning, what I want to do is I want to give you seven, and I know it sounds like a lot, but I'm going to do it as quickly as I can. I'm going to give you seven simple thoughts in regards to this subject, how to get the most out of your local church. Because the point is you're here. You're already here, however you ended up here, however you came here, whether we knocked on your door, whether you heard, watched the documentary or you saw us on Facebook or whatever, you're here. And if you're going to be here, I'd rather you be that success story than the people who just kind of fade away. But what I've seen and what my wife has seen over the last nine years of ministry is that there are some habits that certain people have, some efforts that certain people make, that allow them to be the satisfied customers of Verity Baptist Church. While there are some habits that others have, and some efforts that unfortunately they don't make, that allow them to get disgruntled and fade away. So I'd like to give you seven thoughts. How to get the most out of your church. Seven thoughts, and here they go. I'll give them to you as quickly as I can. Number one. And I'd encourage you to write these down if you don't have a baby on your lap on the back of the course of the week. There's a place for you to write down some notes. Seven things you can do to get the most out of your local church. Number one, show up to all the church services. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, the Bible says this, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Not I'm going to just keep saying it until somebody says amen, all right? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Thank you. And I want you to notice these words. As the manner of some is. See the word manner there? The word manner means custom or habit. 
a manner of life, something you do on a regular basis. And here what, here's what Hebrews is telling us is that some people have a manner or a custom. They have a habit of forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And literally, he's talking about a church service because what are we doing this morning? We are assembling together. What will we be doing tonight? Assembling together. What will we do on Wednesday night? Assembling together. And he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. You say, well, why? Why does it matter? Why can't uh, I forsake the assembling of ourselves together? Why can't I just catch it on live stream, on Facebook and YouTube? Here's why, but exhorting one another. Because you can listen to the preaching online, but you know what you can't do online? You can't enter into a relationship with another human being. You can't enter into the life of someone else. You can't have them enter into your life. You cannot develop relationships. You cannot develop friendships. He says, look, let us consider one another. Notice the context. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. You say, how do we do that? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But here's what we should be doing, exhorting one another, encouraging one another, strengthening one another. And so much the more, as you see the day approaching. See, you ought to have a manner, you ought to have a habit, you ought to have a custom of showing up to the church services. Go to the book of Acts, if you would. Acts chapter 20 in the New Testament. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts chapter 20. Look at verse number 18. Acts 20, verse 18. Some people have a manner of forsaking the assembly. Other people, we'll see here in Acts, have a manner of the opposite. Acts 20 and verse 18. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came to Asia, this is Paul getting ready to leave the churches of Asia, but he's he's giving a farewell address, and he says, You know, you know from the first day that I came, after what manner, after what custom, after what habit I have been with you at all seasons. And whenever I read that, I always like to point out, that includes football season, basketball season, baseball season. What manner I've been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. He said, look, you know that I've been with you and what manner I've been with you at all seasons. And you know that we have served together. We've uh, had tears together and temptations together. And we've had persecutions together. We've lived life together. Go to Acts chapter number 11. Look at verse 26. If you're there in Acts 20, just flip, flip back. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Acts eleven twenty six. 26, the Bible says this, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year, and it came to pass that a whole year, don't miss these words, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. It's interesting that their outside testimony, the world looked at them and for the first time called them Christians. They said, you're, you're like that Christ. You're like a little Christ. And that was connected to their assembling together with the church, their teaching of much people. It was connected to how faithful they were to church. So here's all I'm telling you. And maybe you're not interested. Maybe you don't care. You say, I'd, I'm happy to just fade out and be, you know, lame, I guess, in the kingdom of heaven. I'm happy to be the least in the kingdom of heaven. And if that's you, that's fine. All I'm telling you is this. To get the most out of your local New Testament church, you should attempt to show up to all the church services. You should not have a manner of forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Let me give you a second thing that you should do. You're there in Acts 11, go to Acts 17. Acts 17. Not only should you show up to the church services, but in order to get the most out of your local church, you should show up ready to receive the preaching of God's word. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, the Bible says this, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. How were they more noble? And by the way, they're more noble than other believers, other Christians in another another church, in another city. Why? In that they received the word. I want you to notice, and if you don't mind underlining your Bible, you might want to uh, underline this word, received and readiness. They received the word with all readiness of mind. 
and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. I want you to notice, they went home and they didn't just believe everything that the pastor said. They went and searched the scriptures daily. They grew themselves and understood the Bible themselves. But when they came to church, they didn't have a bad attitude either. They received the word with all readiness of mind. They not only came to church, but when they came to church, they came to church ready to receive the preaching, ready to receive what has been prepared for them, ready. And look, here's all I'm telling you. Look, and I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm just a human like anybody else. But I can tell you this. I will do the, my best week after week, Sunday after Sunday, to prepare a biblical sermon that is meant to help you grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And here's what I'm telling you. It won't help you because of me. It'll help you because it's the Word of God. But I can't just preach a sermon and have you grow. You got to be ready to receive it. You got to show up ready uh, to, to hear the word of God. Here's what this means. It means you don't show up to church and then you stay in the foyer talking during the church service. It means you don't show up to church and then you take a nap in the daddy baby room or a nap in the mother baby room or you go out for a smoke break or whatever you're doing out there. It means you show up to church. You say, well, I got that. Great. And then actually be here and turn in the verses and take notes and pay attention. And be ready to receive the preaching. Here's what I'm telling you. There are certain habits that people who succeed in church life have. Now, we're going to do everything we can to make things comfortable for you, easy for you, to, to bring you in, to greet you, to prepare sermons, to have nice music. We're going to do everything we can. But we can't do it all. We need you to do some things. And before you leave here and start criticizing our church that we weren't friendly and we weren't nice and we didn't reach out and we didn't do this and we didn't do that, ask yourself, do you show up to the church services? Ask yourself, do you show up ready to receive the preaching of the Word of God? Here's, here's the third thing. Go to Acts chapter 2, if you would. Acts chapter 2. two. How to get the most out of your local church. Number one, show up to all the church services. Number two, show up ready to receive the preaching. Number three, show up to the special events and activities. Do you know that there's a key factor to church discipleship, Christian discipleship, it's this word, fellowship. Amen. Acts 2.42, and they continued. I want you to notice, the Holy Spirit's going to give us, key us in on a secret here as to how to continue, how to make it, how to be a Christian that this wasn't just a fad. Your family was wrong about you, right? Because that's what your family says. It's just a phase. And for some of you, unfortunately, it was just a phase. How do, you, how do you become the Christian that's not only doing this weeks later, but months later and years later and decades later? Because the Christian life is measured in decades. I don't know if you know that. Before you start getting so impressed about how many weeks you've been serving God, let's talk about how many decades you've been serving God. And they continued steadfastly, here's the keys, in the Apostles' Doctrine. Well, I can get that on YouTube. Yeah, you can. Here's what you can't get on YouTube. And fellowship. And in breaking of bread and in prayers. See, you not only need teaching, you need fellowship. Because you were created to live in community. Galatians chapter 2, if you would, you're there in Acts, you're going to go past Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Galatians chapter 2. And here's the thing about fellowship, and I will tell you this, I work hard and our staff works very hard to do something every year to, to make sure that we've got things going on. And the, the, the events that happen around here, they don't just, we don't just wake up one day and they just, oh, pfft, there, there they are. <laughs> Look at this amazing event that happened. You know, we work hard at it. One day I'm going to preach a sermon to you on the subject of our mission statement. We have a mission statement that's hanging in my office. We've got several goals that we're trying to accomplish. One of our mission statements at Verity Baptist Church is to facilitate fellowship. You may have heard me use that terminology before, to facilitate fellowship. You say, why do you call it that? Because that's all we can really do is facilitate fellowship. We can't make you fellowship. We can't make you develop strong relationships. We can't make you connect in your inner core with other individuals, but what we can do is we can facilitate an atmosphere where you can fellowship, 
Now, like the old quote says, you can take a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. And you know, at Verity Baptist Church, I don't know if you've noticed this, but we spend a lot of time and energy and effort and money, resources, facilitating fellowship. Here's a list of just events that we throw every year. Just, I just quickly just typed up events. I'm pretty sure this is probably the, the majority of them, but you know, every year we have a married couple sweetheart banquet. Every year we host a mega soul winning marathon along with soul winning blitzes. And they always have food and fellowship connected to them. Every year we host, uh, uh, we have an annual church picnic. We have semi-annual children's choirs. We have an annual ladies' tea. We have homeschool seminars. We have homeschool field trips. We have homeschool classes. We have PE class and Spanish class. We've got men's sporting events. We've got men's hiking trips. We've got men's preaching nights. We have family and friend days. We have annual harvest party. We have annual work appreciation dinners. We have pie socials. Just last night or just Friday, we had a big ladies Christmas party. We have a Christmas Eve service. We have a New Year's Eve service. We have a red hot preaching conference. I mean, we, we, we facilitate a lot of fellowship. Well, this church isn't very friendly. When's the last time you showed up to an event? When's the I don't have any friends. When's the last time you showed up to something? And here's what's interesting to me. What's interesting to me is that, uh, that, uh, that, that myself and our staff will work hard all year long to plan out and organize and prepare a red-hot preaching conference. We'll literally have people come here from Australia, from the Philippines, from Hong Kong, from all over the world, all over this country, journey to Sacramento, California. For a red hot preaching conference, and some of you live here! And you don't show up. <laughs> and I think to myself, I think to myself, how hard are you really working at developing these relationships? Because honestly, we're closer friends with people that live in Australia. And we actually see them more often. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9, the Bible says this, and when James, Cephas, and John who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. This is what church does. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So here's all I'm asking you. Here's all I'm asking. How are you doing? Because to get the most out of your local church, you need to show up to the church services. You need to show up ready to receive the preaching. You need to show up to the special events and activities. And here's the thing. I, I don't know what else we could do to help. I mean, look, I realize we teach living a separated life, coming out from among them and being separate. We realize that once you get sold into this thing, you know, now you're not going to show up to a lot of the, the drinking and partying or whatever. We had uh, uh, somebody recently say to my wife and I, when we started coming to this church, we thought, well, our social lives are over. And they were okay with it. They're like, it's more important to serve the Lord. It's more important to serve God. But we're not going to have any more friends. You know, it's basically done. They just kind of gave themselves over to that thought. And they're like, ever since we're going to church, like, we're so busy. We have so many friends. We have so many things to do. Look, we're doing all we can to facilitate fellowship for you. Amen. We can't bring it to your house. <laughs> you got to show up. You got to show up. You're in Galatians. Go to the book of Philippians. After Galatians, you have Ephesians, Philippians, Philippians chapter 1. And you say, well, I'm a visitor. How does this apply to me? Find a local church in your area and do the same thing. Amen. Philippians chapter 1. You're listening online. And I'm thankful for those of you who listen online. But honestly, find a local church in your area and do the same thing. I don't have a local church in my area. Then move. <laughs> Why? Well, that's kind of, look, that's kind of extreme. Jesus died for the church. He builds the church. He's the head of the church. He gave himself for the church. He expects you to be part of a church, and it's a little too extreme. You do it for a job. I'm just saying. People do it for money all the time. Number four, how to get the most out of your local church. You got to show up for all the church services. Some of you are like, Pastor, I don't like it when you preach when you're not feeling well. <laughs> Number two, you got to show up ready and receive the preaching. Number three, you got to show up for the special events and activities. Here's number four. You got to show up for weekly soul winning. You got to show up for weekly soul winning. What is, 
What does that have to do with anything? Well, look at Philippians 1. Look at verse 4. Philippians 1, 4. And in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. It's interesting to me that Paul said that there's a fellowship in the gospel. You say, why? Because here's what's really interesting, and here's something that we've learned over the last nine years of ministry, is that sometimes people get really connected once they start going soul winning, because you say, well, soul winning is all about reaching the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, but you know what we do in between doors? We fellowship. And especially at this church, where we partner you with a different partner every week, you get to know other people, you get to uh, be introduced to other people. There's, there's, it, it, it's really a great way of getting to know other people because it's not this awkward thing where it's kind of like, hi, hello. You know, Facebook has ruined social skills in the United States of America. But when, when we partner you, we give you a map, we're like, go knock these hundred doors. You got something you're doing with another individual. You're laughing, you're joking, you're, you're having a good time between the doors, on the way there, on the way back. People go out to lunch afterwards, whatever. Hey, there's a fellowship in the gospel. We work and labor together. Go to Philippians 4, look at verse 3. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3, the Bible says this, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help. I love, I love this in Philippians and I love this about Verity Baptist Church. Help those women which labored with me in the gospel. Most independent Federal Baptist churches, only the men go soul winning. I love the fact that at Verity Baptist Church, we've got just as many ladies out there knocking the doors, and that's New Testament Christianity. Paul said, hey, can you help those women which labored with me in the gospel? With Clement also and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So how do I get the most out of my church? Well, you ought to show up for all the church services. That's a good place to start. You got to show up ready to receive the preaching. You got to show up to the special events. You might have a good time. You got to show up for weekly soul winning. So what else? Go to Ephesians. Ephesians 5. You're there in Philippians. If you just head back, the book right before is Ephesians. Ephesians 4. Here's a fifth way to get the most out of your local church. You got to find an area to serve. You got to find an area to serve. Every year in November, we have a big worker appreciation dinner that some of you didn't show up to. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We have a big worker appreciation dinner, worker appreciation week, and worker appreciation this, worker appreciation that. Put out this big old list. This year, I think we had 100 and some odd names on that list. You say, why do you have so many workers? You know, my goal is to have everyone in our church on that list. <laughs> you say, why? You need that much help? No. In fact, sometimes it's easier to do it ourselves. Why do you want so many workers? Because working and serving is a key element to Christian maturity. He prove it to you. Ephesians 4, look at verse 11. Notice what the Bible says. Ephesians 4, 11. And he, the he there is God, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists. Here's you. Here's what he gave you. And some pastors and teachers. You say, Why? Why did he give apostles? Why did he give prophets? Why did he give evangelists? Why did he give pastors? Here's why. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. See that word perfecting or the word perfect in our King James Bible? It's not the same word as the way you and I use it today. It's an older word, perfecting or perfect. It means to make complete or to make mature, to make whole. He says, God gave you a pastor for the perfecting, for the completing, for the maturing of the saints. Well, how do we do that? How does the pastor do that? Here's how he does it. For the work of the ministry. See, you were not saved by works, but you were saved to work. And our job is to try to put you to work. To get you to serve. Why? For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Verse 13. Till we all come in the unity. You're created for community of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a, don't miss it, unto a perfect man. Mature man. Complete man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What does that mean, measure of stature? It means fully grown. Just like a baby, we want them to get fully grown to be an adult. 
God said, hey, he gave you a pastor to put you to work because it's good for you to serve. It'll help you mature. It'll help you be perfected. It'll help you grow. Look at verse 14. I just want you to understand the context. That we henceforth be no more children. Why? Because when we're perfect, we're mature. We're fully grown. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the side of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait. You say, how do I get the most out of my local church? You got to find an area to serve. Go to Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew chapter number 6. First book in the New Testament. Should be fairly easy to find. Matthew chapter 6. We're talking about how to get, we're talking about how to get the most out of your local church. You gotta show up for all the church services. You gotta show up ready to receive the preaching. You gotta show up for the special events and activities. You gotta show up for weekly soul winning. You gotta find an area to serve. Here's point number six, and I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I do want to touch it because I think it's important. You gotta get financially invested. You gotta get financially invested. Okay, well, what, do you, what does that mean? It means you got to give to your local church. To get the most out of your church, you got to give. Ah, you guys need money. I, honestly, and I'm not saying this in a boastful or prideful way, we're fine. We don't need your money. I don't know what I was to say. That probably didn't come out right. I'm not feeling well, okay? Um, <clears throat> the point is this. It'll be a bigger blessing for you. You know what Jesus said? It's more blessed to give than to receive. Matthew 6, 21. See, this is why some of you don't like me saying that. Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's also why you'll move for a job and not move for a church. <laughs> for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I don't, these are all I'm telling you. You want to get the most out of your church? Get financially invested. Go to Proverbs chapter 18. We'll leave it there. Proverbs 18. If you open up your Bible just right in the center, you're more than likely following the book of Psalms. Right after Psalms, you have Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18. Here's point number seven. We're done, all right? Point number seven, we're done. I'll give you a couple of verses here, a couple of verses in the conclusion. We'll be done. Proverbs 7. How to get the most out of your local church. Number one, show up to all the church services. Number two, show up ready to receive the preaching. Number three, show up to the special events and activities. Number four, show up for a weekly soul wedding. Number five, find an area to serve in. Number six, get financially invested. Here's point number seven. How to get the most out of your local church? You got to make an effort to be friendly. Proverbs 18, 21. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Sometimes the way these verses are written in an older for way, they, they might seem confusing in our, in our current format. The verse is not saying that, oh, I've got friends, I guess I better be friendly. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, you want friends? You must be friendly. I don't know how they have so many friends. Well, a man that has friends must show himself friendly. You understand what Solomon's trying to tell you? You know that everybody makes friends the same way? Isn't that interesting? Every age demographic, whether it's grade school, middle school, high school, college, your job, whether it's, it's church, no matter what culture, no matter what country, no matter what age of, of history, you know that everybody makes friends the same way by being friendly? I don't know why I don't have any friends. Maybe because you're not very friendly. Maybe you ought to be nice to people. Maybe you ought to not say mean things to people. I'm just telling you, everybody makes friends the same way. There's no secret to it. A, friend, a man that had friends must show himself friendly. I don't have any friends at church. Be friendly. I don't know what that means. We know. <laughs> Honestly, I, pre I, I spent a lot of my time preaching sermons on people skills and dealing with people and relationships and things because a man that had friends must show himself friendly. Amen. And here's what I know. Here's what I know. For you to get the most out of your local church, you need to make an effort to be friendly. Go to Malachi chapter 3, last book in the Old Testament. Should be easy to find. Malachi chapter 3, look at verse 16. Malachi 3, 16. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16. Notice what the Bible says. Just the first part of this verse. I love it. Malachi 3, 16. 
Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. They spake often one to another. Because a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. So here's all I'm telling you. Here's all I'm telling you. Why don't you show up early? Why don't you stay a little later? Why don't you actually try to make some friends? Because in order for you to not just fade out, in order for you to be a satisfied customer, and here's the truth, we want as many satisfied customers of Verity Baptist Church as possible. You've got to put in some effort. Go to Mark chapter 4. You're there in Malachi. You're going to go into the New Testament, book of Matthew, then you've got the book of Mark. Mark chapter 4. How to get the most out of your local church? Show up to all the church services. Show up ready to receive the preaching. Show up for the special events and activities. Show up to the weekly soul winning. Find an area to serve in. Get financially invested. And make an effort to be friendly. Because here's the truth. Here's the truth. You will get, you say, I don't know, this church is really needy. Look, it's this church, it's any church. It's any church. People get this idea, oh, if I just move to Arizona. <laughs> You're going to have to be friendly to those people too. <laughs> this church or any church, you will get out of it what you put into it. This is just a rule of life. Mark 4, verse 24. And he said unto them, Mark 4, 24, and he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Man, I should like to, when I go through a trial, have a whole church family, a whole army of Verity Baptist Church family come alongside me, help me, encourage me, comfort me, help me throw a funeral, help me raise some money. I sure like that. Well, you know what? With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. Luke chapter 6, if you're there in Mark, if you just flip over to Luke. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Luke 6, verse 38. This is taught throughout Scripture. The Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Well, you guys should just show, I should be a jerk and never show up to church services, not go to any activities, not be friendly, and you guys should just treat me like a king. That's not how it works. Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall man give into your bosom for with the same measure that ye meet with all it shall be measured to you again. You will get out of this church or any church what you put into it. So here's the question I have for you. What are you putting into it? Which family are you in our tale of two families? Are you the satisfied customer? Are you slowly fading away? And here's the worst part. I've been preaching this in one direction telling you what you need to do in order to be connected and get the most out of your local church. But here's the truth. If you remember in, Romans, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, we, we're told that God set you here to be part of this church. God placed you here. And you know what the worst part of you not putting in your effort as a good church member is? It's not necessarily that you don't get the advantage of us, it's that we don't get to enjoy you. We don't get to be friends with you. We don't get to enter into relationship with you because you won't show up, because you won't try, because you won't invest. So here's all I'm telling you. Here's all I'm telling you. You will get the most out of this church when you put in the effort, you will get what you put in. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> Lord, I do thank you that this church is filled with satisfied customers. And I don't know if it's rude to say it that way, and I hope people understand my heart. There's people that love this church, that are happy to be part of this church. And Lord, I thank you for them. 
there are some people that may be a little disconnected, a little disgruntled. And wherever we have failed them, Lord, I pray that you would help us to have open eyes to see those failures and to, to come in and to be there and to bring that in. But Lord, I pray you'd help them also to take responsibility for their part in this relationship and help us always to realize that we will get out of this church and any church what we put into it. And help us to take the responsibility of church life seriously. In the matchless name of Christ, we pray. Amen.